So in this section, we're going to be creating our first basic neural network. The package that we're going to be using for creating our neural network is under mxnet.gluon.nd. So nd is the alias here for neural network, similar to the alias we used before, which was nd for nd array. So the first layer we're going to be creating is a dense layer, also known as a fully connected layer. And in this example, we're creating a dense layer with two output units or hidden units. So if we had to look at an example of a neural network architecture using fully connected layers, here we've got three fully connected layers, each with six hidden units. And a fully connected layer will take the inputs from the previous layer or the input layer and multiply those values by a weight matrix potentially adding a bias, and that's how you'll get your values for the hidden units. So now that we've created the dense layer, we'll have to initialize the weights in that weight matrix and the bias terms as well. So we can choose the way that this is initialized, and by default, we're going to be uniformly picking values between minus 0.7 and 0.7. One thing to note here, though, is that the initialization isn't going to be happening as soon as you run that line of code. It's going to wait to infer the shape of your input before determining how many weights you're going to need to initialize. So to get things started, we're going to need to create an example input. So here we use what we've learned from the ND array video, and we're going to create an ND array using random numbers, uniform numbers. And the shape of this input is going to be three rows and four columns. Now with this input, we can pass it to the layer. And it's at this point the initialization happens. It knows that the input is of shape 3, 4, so it can work out the correct size of the weight matrix and initialize those values uniformly from minus 0.7 to 0.7. We could also view this as a batch of three samples, each with four inputs. So the output, after passing it through this layer, will be again a batch of three, but now two output units. So we've gone from four input units to two output units. So now that the initialization has happened, we can inspect the weight matrix. And the way we do that is by referencing the weight property of the layer and calling the data method. So this will now print out the weight matrix associated with the layer. And we can see the shape is two rows by four columns. Because we've got the four input units denoted by the columns and the two output units denoted by the rows. So a typical neural network doesn't just have a single layer. We have multiple layers connected in different ways. And it's very common for these layers to be chained together sequentially. And so Gluon provides a really nice interface for creating these sequential models. And you'll find it under nn.sequential. So in this code block, we're going to be implementing what's called Lunet, and it contains different convolutional layers with pooling stages and fully connected layers at the end. So using our sequential block, we can add layers individually, or we can add lots of layers all at once. So here we're just using one add command, and we've got lots of different layers that we're adding to our network. So as we saw before, we don't need to specify the input dimensions of these layers. It will wait until the first time the network is used to infer the correct shapes for the weights and the bias terms. So one of the first layers that we're going to add to our network is a convolutional layer, and this is across two dimensions. When you're initializing a layer, you often get lots of different parameters that you can configure. So for the dense layer, we had the number of output units. For a convolutional layer, we can define the number of channels, so it's the output filters that we want. We can define the kernel size, and we can also define various activations that are going to be applied after the convolution. So here we've got six output channels. We've got a kernel size of five. So five denotes a five by five. It will assume square unless you specify otherwise. And our activation will be a ReLU. After this, we then add a max pool, again across two dimensions. And we have different parameters available. So here the pool size is two by two, and we're going to stride two by two as well. And these two layers are then repeated again, this time with a different number of channels and a different kernel size. And then we move down to a flatten. So our input to the flatten layer will actually be four-dimensional. 
The first dimension will be the batch, the second one will be the channel, and then we'll have height and width. And flatten will reduce this to two dimensions. So we'll still retain the batch dimension, and then all the other remaining three dimensions will be flattened into one dimension. So the result will be two-dimensional output. This is then passed into two dense layers with different number of hidden units and with relative activations. And we'll finish with a dense layer with 10 output units. So we can then print this network. And we'll see all our layers are applied sequentially as we've defined. So this sequential model is really similar to the dense layer that we saw before. And both of them actually are subclasses of something called an NN block. And as we saw before, uh, the initialization is lazy, so it waits until the first input is passed. So let's generate some random data. So here we're trying to generate what you'd expect from an image. So we've got batch size of four, we've got one channel, so it's grayscale, and then it's 28 by 28, so it's a square image. So it's four grayscale square images. And we pass this input to the network, at which point it will initialize the network with the correct weights of the correct sizes and give us an output. Our last layer had 10 output units, so Y has the expected shape of a batch size of four and the second dimension being 10. So something we can do with a sequential network is index to a particular layer. So if we take the network and we slice the very first layer using the index of zero, we get the convolutional layer. And if we look at the weight for that convolutional layer, we'll see it's got shape six by one by five by five. So the six is because we specified six output channels or six filters. So we can have a look at that in the definition. We have a convolutional 2D with six channels. Uh, then we have a one because the input was a grayscale image because there was only one channel specified. And the five by five is because when we define the layer, we specified a kernel size of five, which meant five by five. We could also inspect the sixth layer, which is indexed by five. And if we were to look at the definition of the fifth layer, so here it was the dense layer, and it had 120 output units. So with 120 output units, we'd expect 120 different bias terms. And so that's where we get 120 of the shape for bias. So the next thing we'll do is we'll look into how it's possible to cool a block. So we had the dense layer and we gave it input data and we had the sequential network and we gave it input data. And so that's all defined through a forward method. One of the benefits of using sequential is the forward method will be constructed automatically using the layers that you specify. But you have more control over this forward method and you can define it in, a, in whichever way you would like. So what we're doing here is creating our own block. And as we saw before, a block could be a layer, it could be a collection of layers, or it could be a complete model. So the first thing we need to do when we create a block is to create a subclass of NN block. So here we're calling our new block mix MLP, and that inherits from NN block. And we define the initializer for that class with the init method. The first thing we want to do is we want to use the init method of NN block. And so with Python, you can call the init method of your parent class using the following line. And we'll use a sequential block again and add two dense layers, one with three output units and one with four output units, both with relo activations. And then we're going to create a dense layer outside of the sequential scope with five output units. So this is really just to demonstrate the ways that we can combine different blocks and we have full control over the order in which they're going to be called. And so now we have all the layers initialized, the forward method defines how we're going to use these layers and in which order. And so the forward method takes in input as an ND array and returns an ND array after being processed by the various different layers. So the first thing we do with the input here is we pass it to the sequential block that we defined with the two dense layers, which will give us an output of Y. So here, because we're dealing with ND arrays, we can actually print out the values of Y at this stage when it's been passed through the network. So the last thing we do is pass Y through the last dense layer, five output units. And the output from this is then returned by forward. So very similar to what we did with the layers above, we instantiate the block. So here, mix MLP, and we can print the block 
and we'll see which layers have been defined as part of the block. And because we get full control over the definition, this allows us to be really flexible and how we define the models. So we can create dynamic graphs, for example. As in the examples we've seen before, we initialize the network, which is going to be lazy initialization once it's seen the input. And here we generate some random input data, which is two by two. And then we pass this input to the network. And it's at this point the forward method gets called. So the x that we give network here is the same x that will be passed to the forward method here in the mix MLP block. And because we've got a print statement, we're actually going to see the print of y after it's been passed through the block, the sequential block with the two dense layers. So because the last layer of the sequential block had four output units, we'll see a two by four matrices being printed out here. Two because the batch size was two in our original input. And then in addition to that, we're going to get the final output of the mix MLP block. And because the dense layer had five output units, we're going to see a two by five matrix. As we did with the sequential block before, we can reference particular layers and access their weights. So here, by accessing the mix MLP net, we can reference BLK, which was our block that we defined in our init function. And then we can reference a particular layer in the block. So here it's the second layer of the block, which if we look again at the initialization of mix MLP, is going to be this layer here with four output units. The layer before had three output units, so we're going to get a four by three weight. 